a bit lit, celebrating creativity and research of all kinds. James, Nareen, very good to see you. Thank you for joining us. We're here today to uh, celebrate uh, James Bailey's brand new book on Muriel Spark. Uh, and before we do that, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves. So James, would you would you start? Yeah, thanks so much for organising this, Andy. Um, and thanks for Nareen as well. Um, yeah, my name is James Bailey. I uh, am a writer and a researcher. I got my PhD in English literature a few years ago. Uh, with a thesis about Muriel Spark, which has been the, the obviously the subject of the new book. Um, I no longer work in academia. I work for Arts Council England, and I do a lot of work around, I suppose, I suppose the, the cultural recovery going on at the moment uh, in the wake of the pandemic and how we might bring uh, our cultural uh, landscape and cultural ecology back to life, as it were, um, after kind of devastating impact of COVID-19. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about that, thinking about funds, thinking about how to communicate uh, really essential ideas about art and, and the purpose of art and culture in, in the world we now live in. So today, chatting to you has been a, is, is a bit of a nice break from that and, and a step back into the things that I was spending all day, every day thinking about a few years ago, uh, what Spark was trying to achieve with literature, uh, with narrative techniques. So um, it's a real pleasure, actually, to be, to be able to have this conversation. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for the work you're doing in the Arts Council as well. I mean, a bit lit is a kind of tiny version of uh, a space set up to try and celebrate arts and humanities, creativity and research at a time when it feels they can easily be sidelined because of a medical emergency. Um, so we're really delighted to have you both as, as a Sparkian, is that the right word? I don't know, but also as an ASEAN. I'm just going to make those two words up. Um, Nareen, would you mind introducing yourself? Thanks so much for having me. Um, I feel a bit of an imposter being here because I don't work directly on Spark, but I am a big fan. Um, so I'm Noreen Massoud. I'm a postdoc at Durham University and a new generation thinker. Um, and most of well, my first book is on Stevie Smith, who, like Spark, is a mid-century, mid-20th century um, poet and novelist. Um, and I think um, Spark resonates in my work because um, what I what I work, what my first book is on is on Stevie Smith and the aphorism, so a short text which seems to sum up an absolute truth and these values of kind of brevity and concision and polish um, form the kind of basis on which, on which Stevie Smith who writes these very short pithy poems often um, and Spark whose, whose novels are all very slim as James beautifully points out in his book um, there's lots of interesting conversations going on there and these values of kind of wit and embarrassment and humor and the incision yeah fascinated i'm really excited to to get stuck in asking into asking james yeah me too and i'm going to um step back and allow you to do that through most of this film and i'm, I'm mostly here to learn um as, as a non-specialist in the area reading james's book i was really excited i mean i'm someone who's interested in how authorship happens and how authorship gets talked about and how authorship gets received and um james your book is really clearly um trying to intervene in a in a scholarly community which it sounds like kind of boxes spark into very particular kinds of literary craft. Um, and one of the things I love most about your book is the way you drop in Spark's own completely hilarious ways of talking about her own craft. I love the idea that ghosts are a good way of upsetting the reader satisfactorily. I think I'm quoting that rightly. Um, just, just the idea of a writer who will nonchalantly say that that is their intent, I think is really fabulous. And you're so good at talking about Spark as someone who does something different from text to text but who then gets read by scholars <laughs> who don't want that and want to kind of fit people into boxes. That's my own contribution into this conversation. I'm going to step back now, but I'm hoping that that will help orientate listeners to where we might go. Um, but Noreen, as someone um, working in this field much more directly, uh, as you say, not a, not a sparky in yourself, I am just going to use this word, I hope that's okay. Um, would you mind kicking us off? Do you have questions, thoughts that we can throw at James? I've got lots of questions. Um, the first one that kept sort of coming to me as I read the book, um, as someone who loves Spark, but is, feels rather terrified at the thought of working on her. Yeah, I just wanted to, to she, is, she is so terrifying in so many ways, and in, in the ways that she sort of, not just her sort of her vicious, you know, her propensity for viciousness, or the way she's often described as vicious, 
Um, but the kind of impossibility of her novels and, and the way there was never a secure place to stand on, I feel thoroughly daunted by the idea of working on Spark. Um, what made you decide that you wanted to work on her? That is a very true uh, summation of, of, of the feeling of, of looking at Spark. And I, I have to say I share that intimidation. I think I still share that intimidation. I certainly don't feel like an uh, the, the authority on Spark, even having written the book. Um, my way into Spark, I think, is the same uh, as, as a lot of people's way in, which was reading her most famous novel, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, uh, and reading that while still at school and being absolutely, um, absolutely kind of taken aback by the, the sort of precision, the concision, what she's doing with time, leaping backwards and forwards in time within within the space of a single sentence and how much is packed into a single paragraph. You know, there's more, there's more in one paragraph of Spark than other writers would have in 10 pages. So it was always admiration. And there was never a sense that I would ever um, write about her. It was almost like something to be admired from afar. And what's really interesting when you, when you pick up a Spark novel, very, very slim line in your hand, you'll be greeted with a quote on the front more often than not with something on it like elegant, dazzling, uh, stiletto sharp, you know. So her reputation precedes, precedes her and, and there's almost this sense of this is something to admire but not really to engage with, you know, don't try and take this apart, you'll get nowhere. Um, and it was when I was at university and I began to read some of her, her more experimental novels like The Driver's Seat, like The Hot House by the East River. As Andy mentioned just a moment ago, there's a, an idea with Spark that she writes the same novel over and over again. And I think before I'd read those, those particular experimental novels, I, I maybe shared that. I thought, you know, she's a master of these uh, slimline, uh, witty uh, social commentaries about, about these clearly delineated communities of people. And I started to see that, that wasn't the case. And then I became really curious about what she was doing within her career and, and, and why she was leaping from one text to the next, uh, one style, one, one particular technique uh, to the next. Uh, and that really led me into, I suppose, feeling a, a bit braver with Spark, because if this is someone who herself was testing the limits and, 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 and trying out new things, then maybe, maybe I should do that with how I look at her. Maybe I should be a bit less intimidated and a bit more willing to, um, to, to dive in, really, as we were saying yesterday, into, into Spark-infested waters. You know, it, it, it's, I think there's always that fear there because she's so fiercely intelligent and, and, and always one step ahead of others. And some of those novels would seem forward-thinking if they were published today. You know, a novel like The Driver's Seat, I think, would, would startle people now and, and indeed does startle people now. It's really surprising that The Driver's Seat, for example, is over 50 years old. It's, it feels so prescient. Um, so, yeah, I suppose, it, I suppose it was a bit of bravery. Um, and then one final thing, I wrote my undergrad um, dissertation on Ali Smith and the use of time in her novels. And I was fortunate enough to, to meet her during the writing of that. And she just immediately said, you have to read Muriel Spark. <laughs> She's the master of time, of, of narrative technique, of voice, of experiment. And I think that gave me a bit of a license then to go, right, it's really time to dive in here and, and, and really look at, look at this author and what she's doing. If it's okay to jump in here, um, I was interested in a phrase that Noreen used and wanted just to stop and unpack it, if it's all right. And James is kind of bringing us back to it, I think, because I think, James, where you're ending there is, is an emphasis on, on Spark's form. Uh, which uh, personally I get really excited about. And Noreen, you, one, one part of the question you asked was about the impossibility of her novels. Um, would you mind telling I me mean, that, that phrase? I, I'm, I need more help with that phrase. Do you mind telling us what you mean by that? Me or James? Yeah. Um, I am always very, like, the, bit, the thing I always remember is going to the exhibition they had at the Na National Library of Scotland a few years ago and seeing the Muriel Spark the manuscript of the Prime of Miss Jean Brodie. The manuscript feels like an odd word because I think of that as being something that's kind of scribbled over and adjusted. And of course, the extraordinary thing about that, the first draft of the Prime of Miss Jean Brodie written, sort of, I think it's, if I remember right, alternate lines in a spiral bound notebook, is 
there, there were almost no changes. She just concocted it in her brain with all its perfection and its twists and its ins and outs and just poured it out onto the page. Um, there's a lot of pork, isn't there, in, in spark criticism about the, and which you, which you outline really well, I think, James, about, um, about the, all of her work being about this conflict between um, God's master plan and, the, and human beings sort of insight into the plan. And just looking at that, that spiral bound notebook, you know, I felt that the God I was witnessing was spark pouring it out onto the page, all known and never in any doubt. Um, and what you say, James, about there being no kind of point of entry into books like The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie, which are just so elegant and so perfect. So, so like the aphorism, really, like this is what I think is so fascinating, something in which you can't intervene. Everything there is to say has been said um, in, a, in, a, in a novel like The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie and, and in an aphorism. There's nothing you can add, really. Um, and I thought it was really interesting. I'm so sorry, <laughs> we have a, an arrival. More than. Um, That's a very sparky intervention, by the way. <laughs> Isn't it just? I think she reviewed um, a Smith book about cats. Yeah. Well, just to, just to improve Spark, um, um, recommends that all writers should have a cat on their desk at all times because it focuses the mind. And I'm sure right now we're all feeling very focused. Oh, absolutely. On like this curling tail. Morven's tail. Of, uh, before she collapses the whole. <laughs> right, down you come. Okay. Um, yeah, just that sense of, of one as a critic being completely superfluous to whatever's going on. And I think one, one, I feel that certainly with poets like Dylan Thomas as well. There is something which makes me redundant here as a critic. It's just doing its own thing. And I think it's so interesting that your point of entry was the experimental. That's, a, that's something which as critics, we feel much more comfortable being in conversation with because the experimental creates sort of cracks into which we might creep, I guess, and say something. I think that's that's absolutely true. and and it, And it, it was my way in. I think I talk in the book as well about how some of those more perfect novels, like The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie, uh, The Girls of Slender Means, even the short stories, almost um, almost show their containment within the prose. So you'll have The Girls of Slender Means begins and ends with the line long ago in 1945. So it, it's almost saying, here it is. You know, here's the shape of this. This is the this is the world I've it's sealed off. Um, there's her, one of her her first short stories, um, the Seraph and the Zambezi, which which was the thing that won her the Observer Short Story Prize and really kicked off her her career as a, as a writer of prose. Begins and ends with among the crocodiles that look like rocks and the rocks that look like the crocodiles. It's almost like I mean, you know, Spark was originally a poet, you know. She has her her beginnings within poetry, so she's there's so much style there. There's so much there's so much um, concision, and it does almost seem to delimit the need for textual interpretation. It's almost you know, Spark is off. These novels are often compared to jewels and crystals and, and diamonds, and it's almost like something that you that you you behold. But also the shape of them is is crystalline. It's it's something precious and contained. Um, so I suppose one of the things I tried to do, and one of the things that really struck me as I began to research Spark was that even though the texts appear that way, there are always these very deliberate flaws in the crystals. You know, why is it that the narrator of the driver's seat knows completely confidently what will happen the next day, but can't tell you in the present the age or the hair colour of the protagonist? That's that's not uh, an accident on Spark. Spark's part that's very deliberate. She's saying the world appears this way and that there appears to be certainty, but actually there are all kinds of things that aren't quite as they seem. And so those were my ways in, really. And it really surprised me that critics haven't tended to, to look for those cracks. <laughs> it, they've, they've almost looked too admiringly at Spark. She's been too precious to them. Yeah. yeah. Um. I, and I, that's making me think of this gorgeous phrase by Spark that you quote, but well, no, by, by um, a critic that you apply to Spark about mid, I think it's lodged and mid-century literature is um, hesitating at a crossroads. And you apply that to Spark and use that really compellingly, I think, to talk about how we often think of mid-century literature as having either it can go postmodernist, right, or it can go realist. Uh, and Spark makes a kind of third way 
And the way that, and it was interesting to me because the way you describe that third way is something very kind of purposeful and crafty almost. But then that word hesitates, I think is fascinating. And it's interesting to me to even entertain the idea of spark, spark as someone who might hesitate and what that hesitation might look like. But that your, your talk about the cracks that there are in, in the Sparkian world, if you only look closely enough in, and into which you can enter, yeah, I want. I just, yeah, I, I guess I'm just wondering if you'd like to talk about the word hesitate in in relation to spark. Is how do you do you have a sense of that hesitation? How does that come through? I do, and it's it's almost contradictory because it's almost like spark is proud in her hesitation because spark was a deeply suspicious person and a deeply suspicious writer, and suspicion is at the heart of all these novels. There's always a distance. There's always there's always a sort of looking askance at the world, at the world around uh, these characters and, and the worlds they inhabit. But Spark herself was suspicious of, I think, tying herself too closely to any group. So, for example, th these crossroads that, that you that you talk about, that, that Lodge talks about between realism and experiment, that, those were, that was too binaristic for Spark. That was she would never want to be affiliated with with just one of those groups she would always look at both of them with suspicion so you know she would say that the the realists were terribly boring she had no time for the angry young men um uh, cp snow famously lodged a bit of an attack on the experimental novel and she said well i think he's a complete fantasist and i'm the realist here so you know so spark is, is an author who whose novels are full of ghosts and flying saucers and shadows that fall the wrong way. But here she was saying that she was the realist and that C.P. Snow with, with these very kind of faithful depictions of, of domestic lives, for example, said that was fantasy because that was, that was dogmatic in her view. That was, that was adhering too closely to, to a particular movement. But in the same breath, she would talk about writers that she admired like Beckett and Alain Rob Grier, French anti-novelists, for example, and say that she, she admired them, but they were terribly boring. She would read their novels and yawn because nothing was happening. So she didn't, she didn't subscribe to either school. She, she didn't want to be pinned down as anything. She, hesitation was Spark's mission statement. Everything was to be hesitated over and, and looked at with, with suspicion and, and with a, a, sense of, a sense of delay, really, before she, before she approached she was always at the crossroads. I'm so interested now in the coupling. Oh, sorry. No, she was always at the crossroads. Is what I was saying. She's she's always at that at that at that point. I was just going to lob in one one thought, if that's all right, and that's just that hesitate does occupy a, a potentially kind of negative verbal place in modern parlance. But actually, I wonder at its root. I think it's about stickiness. It's about stubbornness. It's about sticking in one place. So it's not about it's not about delaying mm -hmm. making a decision. It's deciding to stay put and to stay in the place where you currently are. So there's a kind of, in a way it's, in the modern modern way we use it, it's kind of all about delaying agency. But actually, if I, I wonder if at its root, it's, it's also can be about, this is where I am. This is where I am as a, as a subjective agent. And this is, where, this is where I'll be working from. Thank you very much. Just wanted to throw that in as a possibility. No, that's... That great and that was sort of the substance of what I was I was saying is like I love your coupling of hesitation and suspicion right because yeah as you point out Andy they, they do seem so different right hesitation is a kind of helplessness or seems a kind of helplessness whereas suspicion is about being a bird's eye view of everything and being able to choose but I love the idea that one might be more like the other or that hesitation yeah might be a way of grabbing I don't know of, of, of like might be a deliberate decision or a, a conscious as you say here I am I think that's so great. Um, sort of in this vein, um, I was really interested when when Spark ex Spark explanation of herself is the most fun you can have, right? And she talks about her her satire wanting to paralyze its object. That it's not about sort of being sentimental or sort of recording the world as it is to make everyone cry, but it wants to paralyze its object. Um, and I sort of had two thoughts about that, and I, I just want, wondered first of all if you talk about to what end does one paralyze an object? What is that social critique setting out to do that other sorts of social critique, like the sentimental, sloppy kind, can't? So that's one. But also this word paralyze, again, like to immobilize, to make powerless, to freeze. Yeah, there seems to be a special kind of not just novelistic work, but a claim being made to political work there. And I'm interested in the fact that it revolves around paralysis. 
Yeah, well, just to give a bit of context to this, so this, uh, what Noreen's referring to is is a, a kind of mission statement that Spark delivered uh, in 1970. She was asked to give a, uh, a talk at the American Academy of Arts and Letters, I believe, and she delivered a a short speech called The Desegregation of Art. And in this speech, she advocates um, ridicule, the art of ridicule, she calls it, as, uh, quote, the only honourable weapon we have left. So, so in this talk, she attacks uh, what she calls the literature of sentiment and emotion. She says that it's, it's characteristic of um, an outdated mode of socially conscious art, and it isn't achieving its ends or illuminating our lives anymore. So in its place, in the place of, of, um, of sentiment, of, of emotion, we, we need ridicule. And, and ridicule, she says, is what can paralyze its object and leave a, a salutary scar in its wake. So... Obviously, if, if you're if you're familiar with Spark, this won't be too surprising because Spark was all about um, looking suspiciously, as we've mentioned, at the world and and finding ways in, finding ways to kind of to kind of jab jab the evils of the world in the ribs slightly, um, and remind our remind us that, that that nothing is permanent and that nothing is sacred, and that anything can be made fun of and ridiculed, and, and maybe that's the way to bring it down. So in this speech, she talks about the experience of going to the theatre to, to see a tragedy and that idea that you, that you watch this tragedy unfold and you're, you're crying, you're brought to tears. And the next day, she says, you rise from your bed, um, all the keener to be in the role of the oppressor, you know, not to be the oppressed, not to be the victim. So what she's saying is that however heartfelt and sincere um, a depiction of tragedy is it's always going to have the opposite effect because it again that that binary of victim and oppressor she feels uh, becomes ever more solid through that approach and you need something uh, that, that takes things down with a bit more invention and and, and something slightly more sly really um, that's what she advocates um, but to go back to your, your question about that idea of paralyzing um, I think I think it's really interesting. I think maybe it comes back to the idea of hesitation, actually, because if you're if you're being sly, if you're ridiculing, if you're causing people to look at things not with emotional investment, but rather detachment, you're almost making the world stop for a moment. You're almost saying, OK, this political leader. And you think about something like the prime of Miss Jean Brodie, which is in many ways is an allegory for fascism. You know, there's, the, there's this school teacher who has a set way of how these these young women should should behave, should live their lives, how their bodies should be, uh, what they should do with with their sexuality, with their brains. And of course, she has these fascist leanings and these fascist uh, sympathies. But Spark never gives us a novel where she says fascism is terrible and, you know, look at the world and, and, and feel, feel outraged and invested within, within the plight of these victims. She's never so direct. She's actually giving you uh, a scenario which is an allegory, which is all to do with humour as well, with wit, allows you to take a moment to make your own mind. So that idea of paralysis, I think, all falls into this idea of just stopping just, just delaying, just taking in the scene, what, watching what's really going on, what, what abuses are unfolding, but making your own mind up, um, again, in terms of how they map out into the world we exist in. We all probably know a Gene Brody. We all probably work with someone. I'm not saying I do, but we all probably work with someone or have worked with someone or have been friends with someone who's been a bit tyrannical, um, oppressive, intolerant, uh, too controlling and I think that's what Spark's doing she's saying that these people exist all around us this isn't an, an us and them thing we we walk among these people sometimes we are them we are the Gene Brody sometimes we're the school children who who find that the course of our lives is being dictated by someone and you don't quite realize until it's slightly too late so paralysis is is, is goes alongside hesitation Spark wants us always to be at the crossroads in life just waiting before we commit to a particular pathway. But also perhaps insisting that the crossroads is where we where we exist in a world which likes to divide people into binaries of good or bad. I wonder if I'm hearing that from you as well. It's not not uh, it's a, a crossroads for um, not just readers, but for, for anybody. I don't know if that's right, but 
kind of insisting on that borderline position that we inhabit between binaries we've more or less invented or, or insisted are there and there and we're, we're over at one of them. I don't know. Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of truth in that. And, you know, if you think of Spark herself, I don't know how Spark would feel now if she was aware of of the way that she'd been, she's been talked about for the last, um, you know, few decades of as, you know, largely the Catholic comic writer. Because that that's a binary, and that, that's that's taking an aspect of her identity and making it the whole. Um, there was so much more to spark. There was so much multiplicity. Um, and again, it, how did she tend to describe herself? Like she had, I don't know if she had to sell herself. And like Smith used to say, born in Hull, moved to London at the age of three, and has lived there ever since. That was her like self description. Um, I wondered if Spark had something similar. If it wasn't Catholic, you know what's really saying. interesting? She she insisted that her gravestone would have poet on it, you know, and her, her beginnings, as I said, were in poetry. And I think poetry is the through line and poetry is there in the novels. Obviously these are concise, very lyrical uh, works with repeated motifs, repeated language, um, language, which, which is, which becomes so familiar that it becomes part of our everyday parlance. You know, you think about the creme de la creme in, in the prime of Christine Brody and, uh, that's through repetition, through through lyricism, through becoming memorable. I think poetry and being a poet was was maybe Sparks the thing that she would tie herself to more than anything. I, I don't think she would have been happy to be to be seen through a particular lens, and certainly the lens through which she has predominantly been seen. Um, so I'm slightly off off topic from what you asked, Andy, but I think it, it does all relate to that idea of the idea of, of not being a particular way, you know, of not, of not f- falling too too closely into a particular category. And of course, you know, when you look at her novels, so many of them are about characters, particularly women, who find themselves contained within a very narrow public image. In fact, she even has a novel called The Public Image, which is about an actor who finds herself cast within a role in and out of the movie world, you know. So this was a predominant concern in her life and in her work. If, it, if it's right, Zooming out. God, I'm sorry, Noreen, I keep doing this. I, this is my, my last question. Um, but if it's right to kind of um, follow up on, on that, I'm just looking at a letter that Spark writes um, to Maysfield. James, I'm sorry, I've got this in front of me and I can't see Mays, Maysfield's first name. So I'm, being, I'm just calling them Maysfield. It's John Maysfield. Thank you very much. Um, in 1951, uh, where she talks about being a poet and says that our next job should be to continue doing the work of the poetry, but at the same time, make our meanings accessible. And this will come through a rediscovery of form. And it feels like that's a shift into novel writing. And I guess I'm interested in the phrase, our next job should, that the, the sense of it being a job and the sense of it having a kind of some sort of moral impetus. I, I now should do something having done this, done this poetry so that the, for, the, the shift into form is accompanied by this notion of coerciveness or I don't, I don't know how to read the word should um there's something there about reflecting on her identity as poet and um novelist about to be I suppose yeah that's really true so um again just for a bit of context Spark was before her career as a novelist she was predominantly a poet and I would also say a literary critic but again she wasn't affiliated with any university she didn't she didn't study anywhere this was this was I mean she was an incredible figure because she just did things you know she just made things happen um often while living in in poverty and and being kind of malnourished in various ways but but was just committed to to following um following her nose really <laughs> just just deciding to 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 write to write books of, of literary criticism and write poetry and and anyway she was writing this biography of john macefield who at the time uh, was the poet laureate and they entered into this quite long correspondence one of the, the pleasures of writing the book um, and before it the thesis was diving into all these letters um and then having the permission to publish them. So this one makes it into, into the book. And this was a, a letter that she wrote to Macefield. They're discussing the purpose of what they do, writing poetry. Um, 
and maybe I should just read this letter in full, Andy, just to just to give people the, the idea of what she's saying. But she says, the world we draw our inspiration from is disintegrated. We, when we write poems, we are trying in a manner to write several poems at once and to speak on different levels. But our next job should be to do this and at the same time to make our meanings accessible. And I think this will come about through a rediscovery of form and the dramatic uses of rhetoric. So this was 1951. Um, to put that into context, she wouldn't have her first novel published for another six years. But already she's thinking about making this kind of leap from poetry. And, and I think you're right, Andy, to look at should, but I think also this idea of rediscovery of form, which you can interpret as, as prose writing, but also rhetoric. And it's really interesting that we've just talked about the desegregation of art and this idea of being rhetorical and being sly and, and getting people to think about, you know, what's between the lines there. So she's already, this is, it's already brewing. This is 20 years before she delivers that speech about, about the use of rhetoric. It's all there in this letter, which is what makes Sparks such a fascinating letter writer, by the way. But there she is talking to Macefield. And I, th and I think what she's saying is the, w the work we do should reach people and it should be a little bit more, perhaps more, more playful and perhaps more kind of world building than poetry in her eyes could be. I think it's important to say as well, I don't think Spark was a fantastic poet. I think she's a fantastic novelist and a fantastic short story writer and a fantastic playwright. And the playwright side of things tends to be overlooked, but but not a fantastic poet. So it's not that she's saying that, that poetry can't do these things. I think maybe it's more that, that her poetry, the poetry she was writing, maybe wasn't the best vehicle for the, the things she wanted to achieve. And I think she's right to think that because because the fiction is so is so fantastic. Um, so that idea of should, maybe she was telling herself, maybe she was saying to herself, maybe it's time for me to do this. You know, Macefield, you're fine. You, you're the poet laureate, that's fine. You, you go ahead, but maybe it's time for me to find this new voice. And it wasn't until Spark was, I think, 39 that The Comforters, her first novel, came out. So she'd had a long time to really brew and really marinate and, and, and decide where, where, where her skills were best placed. Um, and I think that letter, the reason I quote it in the book and the reason I asked for permission from Sparks Estate to have this particular letter in the book is because it, it really feels like a crucial moment of, of, of pivoting, really. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. We're coming towards the, the end of the film, so I'd like to invite Noreen to ask any further questions that um, you'd like to ask Noreen, but also maybe James, after that, do you want to have a think about anything that you'd like us to hear about the book um, as, we, as we're closing up for prospective uh, readers so that they can rush off to the digital or who knows, the actual bookshops in their lives? Um, Noreen. I've got a really frivolous question I want to ask. Um, you and I both spent time in the McFarlane Library in Tulsa, um, where both the Smith Archive and, and a bunch of the Spark Archive is, is kept. And you had a, you've got a lovely little bit at the end of your introduction when you talk about the differences between the Tulsa Archive and the National Library of Scotland Archive. And you say the Tulsa Archive is underrated. The National Library of Scotland Archive is mostly recipe stuff, recipe notes and ticket stubs. And, and I have this, I mean, the work in, working in archives is magical, but also insane like it's just it it there is so much stuff and how do you filter through it and so much of it is so odd um I just wanted to ask you what was the your favorite thing that you found in the archive which you couldn't find a way to get into the book or that if you were to write like you know yeah and any aspect of that or your favorite thing or the thing you always want to tell people about wow that's a fantastic question and well before before I answer that I just want to say that the archive, yeah, the archives are, are, are fascinating with Spark because two very different Muriel Sparks emerge from the archives. You have the Edinburgh archive, which is the one that Spark scholars go to, perhaps because Edinburgh is so central in people's idea of Spark and because the National Library of Scotland do such a fantastic job with, with promoting Spark, especially during the centenary year of her birth. Um, but as you say, Noreen, this is an archive full of receipts and diaries and appointment books, um, which are all fascinating. You know, so much of the correspondence is there, so we shouldn't overlook that. But that really gives you an idea of Muriel Spark, the public figure, you know, this person going about her business. And again, a whole thesis could be written about how someone conducts their literary life. But the McFarlane Library houses a lot of the manuscripts and the notebooks and the research folders. And that is really the, I think if you're writing about the fiction, 
we've talked already about the slim line nature of Sparks' work. And Noreen, you mentioned seeing the manuscript of the Prime of Miss Jean Brodie, which is uncannily similar to the published novel. You know, there's very little difference. So what the McFarlane Library offers is a way of seeing what went into those perfect manuscripts. So what's in the research folders? Which scenes did Spark draft but never put into the manuscript? Um, so that these two sparks emerge, and I, and I think that the, the McFarlane spark is really is really the one that I was I was so fascinated by because Spark is such a perfectionist, and she's seen as so perfect. So what about the experiments that didn't quite make it? What about the, the telephone conversation in the driver's seat, which maybe is the key to unlocking uh, the crisis at the centre of, of Lisa's experience in that novel, but doesn't make it into the novel? So why is she leaving things out? Why why is why is she uh, showing not telling? Um, so that that's really um, been one of the, the biggest kind of pleasures of writing the book and researching it. But in terms of things that didn't quite make it in, in, do you mean things that didn't make it into my book or things that didn't make it into, into Sparks books? I, I think, well, I mean, fa my favourite thing that I found in, in Smith's archive is it's a gigantic roller blind. Um, it's seven foot by six foot and it's got a Smith poem written on it. And this is like all the information I have about it. And this is in Hull, actually. And I'm haunted by this blind, but I can't. I can't make it into anything. I'd love, I'd love for it to be part of something I write, but I can never fit it in. And all sorts of lovely things like cutouts of pictures of dogs and um, sentimental poetry quotations that she's written down. Yeah, I just wondered if you would like a pet object. Do you know what's really actually really interesting? Because we talk about Spark and we talk about, you know, the critics talk about her cruelty. And, and even, and I don't subscribe to the idea of her being a cruel person or a cruel writer. But I think you have to say she's suspicious and she's she's detached and she looks at things in, in, in a very cold way, in a very clinical way. Her Edinburgh archive is full of fan letters and letters from little children who have been reading the Prime of Miss Jean Brodie at school and have done their doodles of, of Miss Jean Brodie and who, who dressed up as, as, as the schoolgirls. And Spark had kept all these things. I mean, Spark never threw anything away. So maybe we shouldn't read too much into that. Her, her kind of her submission statement is you don't throw anything away. You keep everything, every bit of juvenilia writing you, you keep. So maybe we shouldn't kind of have this idea of her as suddenly cuddly because of that. But I do think it's fascinating that she she kept all these things in pristine condition. Um, and I think she I think she liked the idea of being read and not just in esteemed literary circles. You know, even though she was corresponding with with experimental writers like Christine Brooke Rose um, and, and admiring the French anti-novelist like Alan Rob Grier, she was also someone who who probably loved the idea. In fact, I know she loved the idea of being read and, and her work be, and her work traveling, because the other thing in the archive are all these plans, many of which didn't come to fruition, to have novels adapted as TV shows, as films, as musicals, as operas, as radio plays. You know, of course, we know the Prime Minister Brody became a very successful film, and other novels were adapted. But at one point, she was she was commissioning while she's writing the novel, not to disturb. During the process of writing it, she is commissioning her friends to write treatments for stage and screen of this novel. So she's almost going, it's almost, it's almost I mean, again, I was talking about how contemporary Spark is. It's almost multimedia already. It's going, OK, I'm writing this, but I also see it on the stage. And I see it as a musical and I see it as a film. And I want you to give me this script and I want you to give me this script and this treatment. Unfortunately, none of those things came to be. But um, while she's writing not to disturb, she is, she is writing to uh, Alec Guinness, a very famous actor, and saying, I've got this role for you. <laughs> and it's the, central, it's the central character of this novel. And you just go, wow, you know, the amount she was thinking about at once, writing a novel in itself, I think takes up, would take up all of my mental capacity, but she is thinking about every other aspect. So I think it's that really, it's just that absolutely dynamic plate spinning, power that she was that she had <laughs>
gets incredible fan letters from little children reading Brody. Yeah, and I mean, I I wish I could have included some of that in the book just to give a bit more of that flavour of what she was doing. But I have to say, the the, the big surprise writing the book has been getting permission from Sparks Estate to to quote from these letters, manuscripts, research folders, because that isn't a permission that's really been granted before and not to this level. Um, Martin Stannard's very famous biography of Spark didn't get permission. So we had to write around a lot of those things. So I am in slight disbelief. And knowing the book is about to come out any day now, I still wonder if I'll suddenly get an email saying, no, we we, we decided to retract everything. But touch wood, it's not happening. But um, yeah, one of the great pleasures is that this book is full of excerpts from the letters and, and almost the deleted scenes, as it were, from some of these novels. And that's been really fascinating to, to collect together. That's so special. It really is. Uh, if it's okay, I'm going to summarise where I think we've got to, partly for the benefit of the audience, but partly so you guys can correct me and add to um, things that I get I get wrong. But a really valuable conversation. I'm so excited about this book coming out. Congratulations again, James, and thank you, Noreen, for asking such brilliant questions. Um, some of my takeaways are the idea that if an author is trying new things across their work, then the scholar should follow them. And I think the richly methodologically protean nature of your book is one of the great things that's exciting about it. I love the idea it's resting on these archival materials, which other scholars have not been able to interact with in quite the same way. But I think you yourself are so wonderfully adaptable to the material and willing to follow Spark where she might go. I love the idea that her multimedia ness is sort of contemporary, but it also makes me think of, of Dickens writing stories writing multiple stories at the same time while some of those stories are being staged even before he's finished them um, in that sort of Game of Thrones kind of way, you know, where the show is catching up with the composition of the the novel. Um, I love the paradox between something we ended with just now with the archive of not throwing anything away on the one hand, and yet these perfect little novels. How do you do that in the context of this? Like, you know, if I was not to throw anything away, I'd be writing long, verbose, messy novels. So that seems kind of interesting. Um, I like the idea of Spark as someone who wants to be read. And I wonder if that feeds back into the conversation about her shift from poetry to novels, from a genre which is which has a smaller readership to one which in the mid 20th century had a, had a bigger readership. Um, Noreen said one of the most amazing things I've ever heard, which is that the experimental creates cracks into which we might creep. Um, I really, I really value that. But I also feel there's a paradox running through the conversation you two have had about how perfect Spark is and how she doesn't leave room for us to say things. And yet at the same time, James has brilliantly shown us how misread her work has been. So I'm kind of, I'm fascinated um, by that. Hesitation, suspicion, paralyzing things, I think is really interesting. And then the final thing I'll say is that despite her reputation as a comic writer, the word tragedy seems to be really important to James's book. We've had one example of that already, but there's there's a further example in the book where she sends one of her works off and calls it a tragedy. And the editor writes back and says, I can't believe you're calling it a tragedy. Um, I mean, as we all know, that word, the only people who get to define that word are the Bee Gees. But nevertheless, it's really interesting watching this kind of fight breaking out over what we mean by the tragic. That's a lot of stuff just to throw at you both and you don't have to respond at all. But I just wanted to summarize some of the things I was getting Um, from the conversation. Are there any final things that either of you would like to say? Wow, Uh, I'm really impressed by how well you summed all that up and I I agree. Uh, Noreen's uh, comment about about the experimental is one that I I wish I'd known while writing the book because I would have somehow quoted it and attributed it to you, Noreen, because that is really the mission statement of, 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 um, of, of my work, but I think also of Sparks. It was, it was, you know, she talked about literature being something that should that should open a window in the mind, and I love that idea. And I think every single novel, short story, play, really does do that, and it and it, it confronts us with how we view ourselves, with how we view what is tragic. To come back to what you said, Andy, the purpose of ridicule, the, the purpose of of viewing um, figures of, of power and, and of, of oppression and how we how we can view those and how we can change our relation to those views um, and so I suppose I suppose that's that's what her her use of experiment does and I should say my book 
is really focused on these instances of experimentation. So how is she treating the ghost story? How is she treating what we, what we now call metafiction? How is she treating the use of time? It's always tethered. It's never for its own, it's never for its own sake. It's never gimmicky. It's always tethered to um, a real attempt to broaden our own perspectives as readers and, and as people. And that can sound very kind of generic and wishy-washy, but when you when you read the novels, you really see how that happens. Thank you. Um, I was, I, I was going to end by asking what the word literature means to you, but James, I feel like you've just answered that from the point of view of Spark. So that 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 comment, that you did double service there, I think. Um, Noreen, any final comments from you and also literature? <laughs> literature, what is it? Um, Two, I guess, yeah, like um, that, that point about the um, tragedy revealing itself as comedy and vice versa. I'm, I'm so interested, like, it's something I notice a lot in Smith criticism where people are like, yes, but tragedy and comedy go side by side. How can that be? How can they both be in the same space? And it's interesting to me that we have to kind of keep rediscovering the fact that comedy and tragedy are completely intertwine. I mean, not a, just a, quite apart from the idea that, that a comedy is tragedy plus time. Um, you know, tragedy without comedy is, is melodrama, right? Like it's, um, they two what seem absolutely indissoluble for me, but also in the mid century, we have all of these writers who are really, you know, troubling the boundaries between tragedy and comedy in, in an even bigger way. And not just sort of Spark and Smith, but people like Ivy Compton Burnett, um, who I constantly think of while I read Spark. Do you, do you, know, do you work on her at all, James? Um, I haven't worked on her, but you know, yes, I've, I've read her, um, and I, I would agree. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, what is literature? I, um, I one of the things I, I like to say about my work, the things that interest me, is it's it's literature not behaving as we think it should, and that we is not just um, it's not just like fighting with genre or resisting generic definition, right? It's about um, that we as critics have an idea that literature might have to behave a certain way in order for us to get that point of entry, for us to know, to have something to say about it, right? So there, there were kind of, there were reputable ways of misbehavior and disreputable ways of, of misbehavior. Um, and a reputable way is, is you misbehave, but in just the right ways, there's room for a critical essay. Um, and yeah, I, I, I find myself primarily interested in literature that, that misbehaves disreputably uh, in, such a way that it's often been consigned to the realm of, of non-literature. Um, but then if we can find a language for that disreputable misbehavior, maybe maybe then we can invite it back into the, the, the field of literature. Or perhaps not, perhaps we give up on the word, I don't know. Primarily it's useful as a, a way of organizing university courses, perhaps. Yeah, that kind of brings us back to attention running through the conversation, I think, about authorial composition on the one hand, and scholarly readings and misreadings on the other, um, uh, and where, the, where, where one acts upon the other um, in really complex ways. James, I just spoke across you, I think. No, I was, I was really just agreeing. Um, I think, you know, Spark, has, she's full of quotes, as we, as we all know. She's, <laughs> she's the, the kind of master of, of these one-liners, but she did say that she, she, she wants literature to startle as well as please. And I think... It, I mean, it's typically typically concise from Spark, isn't it? But it says everything. It's these were novels that were meant to please. They were meant to be read. They were meant to be adapted and and, and go on their own journeys as films and, and radio plays and and and, and stage adaptations. Count the stage adaptations of the Prime Minister Jim Brodie, but they were also meant to startle, and that means that means different things. It means that they are meant to disturb. They're meant to confront us with things that are uncomfortable at times. Um, but they're also meant to jolt, or you know, the idea of startle. <laughs> we go back to the idea of paralyze. It's it, there are two set really, that make us just stop and, and and take take stock of what the novel's doing, what the no, what not what novels can do, what literature can do, but also what's going on in the world and, and and how we how we respond to things. It's not about immersion. It's not about thoughtless. Um, emotional journeys with things where you're pulled in and your your heartstrings are tugged it's never about that it's about being startled and being on your guard and and forcing yourself to to really um come to terms with 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 what these texts do but also how our own modes of engagement are being uh, are being played with at all times because the world is full of people who 
who who who try to manipulate how how we interact with the world and how how we respond emotionally and intellectually and what what is dramatized in miniature both in her plots but also in the form of her texts are all the things that tug at us as people they, they, that kind of that kind of worm their way into our minds uh, and 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 almost control how we respond to figures of authority, to political discourse, to advertising, to celebrity, to one another. Um, it's all there. It's all there in those novels. Startled and sparkled. Um, thank you both very, very much. Congratulations, James. I'm sorry to end on such a stupid phrase. Uh, apologies to Muriel Spark and James Bailey um, for ending on that note. But congratulations on the book. Noreen, thank you so much for asking such brilliant questions. Um, it's been a really valuable conversation. And I can see this being useful for scholars of 20, 20th century literature, but also as an introduction to Sparks' work. I can feel um, people running to the bookshops, not just for James's book, but also for um, Sparks as well. Thank you both very, very much. Thanks so much. It's a total pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Lovely.